Good afternoon and aloha. No, I came in a little late. I was running from another meeting at City Hall in Honolulu Hale, and I came with Larry Young talking, and I thought he was talking about dengue fever. Clear the gutters, don't let any standing water. Sounds like the speech I'm giving um, now is people worry more about this potential problem. I, fortunately, it's more on the big island, and hopefully they're getting ahead of the issue. But um, I did it, then I realized, oh, he's talking about roofing and gutters. Okay, all right, so I asked him. But um, it's really nice to be here before you guys. Um, I think I've come here before, maybe not to speak, but to participate when I was an attorney at Ashton Riston. I spent most of my professional life practicing law in real estate and banking and finance and um, came to politics late in my life. But I'm so glad I did. I think being mayor of Honolulu is the best public service job you can have in the world. And I tell everyone that. And um, the reasons why I believe that are twofold. One, I mean, I think we live in the most beautiful place. Think about it, we're right here in Waikiki. It took me 10 minutes from Honolulu. And I go out all the time surfing at Pops. If we paddle out right now, you're gonna see incredible reef life in a dense area. Waikiki is dense. And Honolulu and Oahu is dense. But if you come home with me to Manoa, we'll get to my house in 10 minutes. You drive five minutes more in the back of the valley and I'll take you hiking in virgin rainforest. Where do you find that anywhere else in the world in a city? where that quickly you can have access to the most incredibly beautiful things. And I say, you know, Mother Nature was good to Oahu. We got great bone structure. But the thing I think is more special and the thing that gives me chicken skin every time I fly in when I come back from the continental United States or other places around the world is that I get to make mayor of the people of this place, almost a million strong now on 640 square miles. It's the diversity I'm talking about. There's no one majority in this room. We're all minorities. And that's true throughout this island and the state. And we sit around round tables like this where you want to know about each other and where you came from, whether you were here before Cook or whether you arrived last year. And we're truly interested in your story. And then we celebrate a diversity, whether it be in New Year's or Chinese New Year's or in any of these other holidays. We know each other's cultures. We celebrate them and we love them. That's what's special. And there is nowhere else in the world as diverse as this place that works so well. And I am so lucky to be mayor during, you know, at a place like this. But I did want to talk to you about the issue of homelessness. Um, as was mentioned, you know, I ran on five priorities. Our roads really were bad. I heard from everyone. We've actually now paved 923 lane miles of roads. I mean, no one has done that ever in the history of the state, not the federal government, not the state government, not the county government. We've done it, and still people complain every day about the bad roads. A lot of them are becoming more state roads now because ours are getting better, and they'll come, hey, Caldwell, you gotta do Poly Highway. It sucks. Come in, man, you gotta do something. These are state roads. We're having a hard enough time paving our county roads, but we are doing a lot, and we're not gonna stop. I committed to pave 1,500 lane miles of roads in five years, and we're getting, we're on target. We're a little bit behind for this year, but we did more in the first two years. You know, restoring bus, I am passionate about mass transit. And buses, man, when guys say, hey, Kirk, no one's gonna ride the rail, we're not mass transit, we're not New York, Boston, San Francisco, even DC. And I go, okay, what about bus? That's not mass transit. I say every day, 225,000 people take the bus. That's a quarter of our population, take the bus. They get off a car, they get on a vehicle with a lot of other people, they go somewhere. Whether it's a train or bus, we do use mass transit. And the interesting thing is about a quarter of those guys own a car, but they take the bus, probably because they can't afford to pay for gas or they can't pay for parking. And so I think mass transit is about social equality. It's about justice. It's about helping people. Think about those ladies who live out on the west side who come here to Waikiki to clean roads and how hard it is to get here. And when they get here, the parking and the rest. So whether it's bus or whether it's rail, I support it. And I committed to restoring bus routes that have been previously cut. So as you, the guy mentioned this, this is so cool. In Kani, between Kaneo and Kanua, we are digging a tunnel, 13 feet in diameter. You can drive a car through it. That's 400 feet below the surface that's gonna allow sewage to flow by gravity. Right now we pump it under pressure. And when it breaks, it ain't a pretty picture. It broke right in 2006 and 48 million gallons went into the Alawa Canal and onto the beach. 
Well, we are going to let it flow gravity style. So you're saving electricity, it has a lot of capacity for storage, and I want to do more of these types of projects around the island so that we can get away from using electricity and be more sustainable. But we're doing tons of sewer improvements all over this island so you guys can build more things. And I am about building. You know, some people give, say I get, you know, I'm too pro-development. And others say I'm not strong enough for development. But I support every project that has been proposed in Waikiki. I support Ho'opili, Koa Ridge. I support the Kakako projects. I do believe that you know, different types of housing is important. I'm not against high-end housing. Much of the housing in Kakako is not going to be owned by people who live there. And as you know, we have a residential aid tax rate now, so anyone who doesn't live in their home, I have a second or third home, they pay almost double what the rest of us pay, and that goes into our coffers to help pay for road repaving and the sewer and all the rest. So I support these projects, but I'm passionate about development in the urban core inside our urban growth boundaries so we can preserve our outlying ag lands and our lands going up our ridges and valleys to keep them open and green for that beauty that I talked about that we all love. But how do you do that? Is you go up, not out. And the only way you can go up is if you have capacity in your sewer system and that's what we're doing with our sewer system to make sure we have that capacity. And the final one was parks. We are doing a lot, you know, we, we've had, it's not covered too much, but we've restored a lot of bathrooms, we rebuilt playground equipment that's been trashed. And what happens within a week? Graffiti inside the bathroom, the urinal's broken, ripped off the wall, park equipment that we just put in is set on fire if it's plastic. And I ask myself, it's hard enough just to cut the grass. We should be able to do that, but as you see with all the rain, the grass is tall. But when we're fixing things that are destroyed immediately thereafter, how do we do that? How do we handle this? Now in other cities around the world, this does not happen. And we don't do this to our own backyards or front yards, and our parks are exactly that. How do we get a culture going here where don't do that because you're hurting us? When you burn that playground equipment, it's the children in your community, your brothers and sisters, or the kids of your aunties and uncles who are not benefiting. And I'm asking you to help me figure out ways to do that. So we have Kako for the parks, Kako working together. Um, and we're hoping as we restore bathrooms and playgrounds, we're asking canoe clubs, civic clubs, neighborhood boards to adopt it and to step up and say, this is our park, we're not gonna allow it to happen. But the last one was homelessness. As I was running, and homelessness has always been an issue here, it was more hidden. To say this has ever been an affordable place to live, I was born in 1952. And I remember while I was born in Waipau, in a plantation hospital, I remember as a kid in Hilo, opening up the newspaper from, Hawaii, from Honolulu and seeing ads for beautiful pictures of houses in Kahala. And they were selling for like 350000 in the late 1950s. And a house in Hilo was like $17,000. I couldn't believe, wow, how can someone afford a place? What is that? But it, hi, even back then, very expensive to find housing on this island. And instead of running from homelessness and saying, that's a state issue, and that was a debate that happened before, I said, it's happening under my time, it's an issue, and I embraced it. And I've gotten a lot of criticism. Some people say I'm too harsh in enforcement. Other people say I'm not harsh enough. And almost everyone says that we need to provide more housing for the homeless, and I absolutely agree. So, you know, when you look at housing for the homeless or housing even for us, so much of the demand for housing is not market purchase, it's rental, rental. In our country in 2014, over 400,000 rental units were built in one year, all over, and they weren't all low end. I mean, you're building rental units in Manhattan that are through the roof, that are beautiful, with dormant in the front. But the point is, that's the hot market. It's not condos, it was rental units. In our state, what's the hot market? Condos. Who has built rental? Well, Stanford Card built Halikula Place at 16, 80% MI, MI, and it took eight years to get that done, developing his capital stack. And more recently, Kapole Lofts, which is a great project. Campbell Corp gave the land for zero, and that helped incentivize building this. But nothing else, no new projects. What's wrong? 
Why can't we build to a market that there's so much demand? And the problem is our income and the rent we gotta pay is way out of, way out of sync. So I wanna give you, for someone working full time, 40 hours, they'd have to make about $34.81 per hour to afford for rent for a two bedroom apartment. Now there are people who make $34 an hour, almost $35 per hour. If you're a member of a construction union, you may, if you're a subcraft, an, an engineer, I mean a plumber or electrician, but if you're a carpenter, you're not making that. And that is a lot of money for many, many people. If you're making a minimum wage of $7.75 per hour, that's our minimum wage, you'd have to wait, work 80 hours a week to afford that rent. 80 hours, that's like double 40 hours. You know what, there are people that are working that. There are people, my mother-in-law is now 94 and she has people come in and help her for dinner. And this lady told me the other day, yeah, I go from here to another job and then I take care of a lady all night long and then I go to work in the morning. And she has a family. And that's not unusual. You know, we have very low unemployment on this island. It's less than 3 point, it was down to 3.2%, it's back up to 3.4. Full employment is 3.5. But how many people are working three and four jobs just to pay that rent? Tons. And we know those people. So there is a huge issue on affordability. We all know that. But homelessness is a result of that affordability. You ask any provider, and when I became mayor, I went with all the providers, how do I solve this problem? They told me, Mayor, build affordable housing. If you build affordable housing, and allow more housing generally, but more affordable housing, the homeless problem will become less. So it's grown. And I want to give you figures. And you know, nationally, homelessness has been dropping, except in a few very big cities. And Honolulu is one of them. But we have other cities too that are on there. LA is another one going up, New York going up. But I want to give you in 2015, we had, we can't do a point in time count, we had about 4,900 homeless folks on this island. Now, when I give that figure, those are people who don't own a home, but some are sheltered every night, and about half are sheltered. A little more than half are sheltered every night, and that's a testament to all of us. You talked about your angels program. That says a lot of us about us as human beings, that we actually will step up and fund not-for-profits like IHS to shelter people, and we should feel good about it. The rest are unsheltered. So in 2014, there were about 4,700, so it went up by about 200. In 2013, when I took office, it was 5, 4,500. So it's been moving up every year. Are we surprised? For the last two months, the average price of a home on this island, 720, 720,000, and then $730,000. Down payment, 10, 20%, and then the mortgage payment. Who can afford that? If you don't have a parent, and my parents and my wife's parents helped us buy our house by giving us part of the down payment. We, could have, we were saving, but every year the house got more expensive and we had to gather more and it was impossible. And we were lucky enough that our parents could help us. But without the help of your parents, very hard to buy a house today in Hawaii. Um, but I committed to tackle this. And so I did a bunch of things right up front, immediate action. I asked the providers and I asked them, how do I solve the homeless problem? They said more affordable housing. They also told me you're never gonna solve it. So I never say I'm gonna solve the homeless problem because every year there are more people graduating that are gonna become homeless and why? They got drug addictions, they got mental illness, they have alcohol addictions, they have weak family structure, poor educational system and people fall out and they become homeless. And it's hard to address those as a city mayor. You don't deal with education, you don't deal with health issues. And so don't ever say you're gonna solve it, and I don't. But I say I'm gonna tackle it and make it better and reduce the number. They also told me, when I became mayor, they're homeless at Thomas Square, remember, in Hobb Park, King Street, Baratania, Waikiki. And they told me, if you allow it to be convenient for people to sleep on sidewalks, to camp on sidewalks and in public parks, they will stay there. Because there's no rules, no curfew, no nothing. They can have their drugs and alcohol, they can have sex with underage kids, they can do whatever they want. You go to IHS, you gotta follow the rules. 
everyone in this room follows rules. And so they said, if you make it less comfortable for them to stay in these places, more of them will move into shelter and adopt those rules. So I developed what I call compassionate disruption, where we passed laws, worked hard on it, stored property ordinance, sidewalk nuisance, sit lie, to tell people you cannot stay there. And then we put teams together. One team, can you believe, five days a week goes out at two in the morning. When we're all sleeping, they're out enforcing stored property orders and sit lie. And the reason they're doing it then is our parks are closed at night, right? We close, parks, when I, parks used to be open 24 seven. Now we have to close our parks because of the homeless. And it hurts me because when we close our parks, that means all those fishermen that go into our parks to fish at night, particularly Native Hawaiians and their issues on you know, Native, Native Hawaiian gathering rights, they can't go either. They can get down to the shoreline, they can be on the shoreline, but they can't park in our park, they gotta haul everything through. It's really tragic that we punish the good people with those who are abusing. So we shut our parks at night. If you enforce during the day, what happens? Those guys just get off the sidewalk and move into the park, and you can't force someone out of a park when it's open and they're sitting on the grass because we'll be sued if we only go against the homeless guys. You can't say, well, you look dirty, you're out. You're just a guy who came in from surfing, you can stay. So we do it at night, they can't move into the park, and now they have to move. And we take whatever they leave behind. So that's the compassionate disruption. And we're doing it at the same time that we're reaching out to folks, whether in the Waimanalo, Waianae, Waikiki, or Wailua, before we enforce, we go to these communities and say, we have shelter space, we have a little card we give them, here's the shelters that are available. We check every day before we enforce how many beds are available. Uh, we ask people from the IHS and others to outreach and say, come with us. The vast majority don't go. They just don't want to follow the rules. But I'm going to continue to enforce and then make it less comfortable. It's complaint driven. We go to where the complaints are. And of course, the complaints are where the biggest problems are, the places I described. And I'm asking you, I'm just gonna give you this number. If you ever have complaints, please call 768-3585. 768-3585 and call in and we'll go there and check it out and enforce. Um, but, so you're gonna say, okay, if you're doing all this, how come Kaka'ako got so bad? Kaka'ako is controlled by HCDA. HCDA was created to punish Frank Fossey for running against governors, right? He ran for governor so many times, and um, so the state said, that's enough, we're taking the heart of your city away from you, creating a separate jurisdiction, it's under state control. It's been under state control for over 30 years. And so we didn't force in Kakako because it's not under our jurisdiction. And when it got so bad, and we had to step up, we had to negotiate a right of entry with the state, an actual agreement saying we have the right to go in and enforce on your property. Just like I cannot enforce on private property unless you ask me, because it's your property and the state's property is not county property. And we did, and through a phased enforcement, we moved everyone out, and they're still gone. I jogged through there, Ohi Street, Olamihani. Bunch of them went into shelters, at least for one night. I think a lot of them probably left after one night because they don't like the rules. And where else did they go? It is so frustrating. They went into Kakaaka Waterfront Park in Kewalos and they're there today. And the state is now gonna to have to gear up and move them out of there. But that's the disruption part of the compassion. But I wanna give you some statistics. When we enforced in Kakako, when we went to all those streets, 67 tons of trash, just on the sidewalk, 67 tons. 41 shopping carts, 106 cubic yards of different types of metals, mainly shopping carts, 129 hypodermic needles, and you're eating lunch, I'm not gonna describe the other stuff we had to move, but it was disgusting and horrible. And our city workers have to do this. Pick up stuff and get ukus jumping on them. Pick up stuff and having centipedes and scorpions running out. And picking up the waste. And now we're being sued for it. We're being sued by the ACLU. And if they succeed in their lawsuit, we stop enforcement. Every week right now, besides Kakako, we remove somewhere between four and 11 tons of stuff on our sidewalks. If they win the suit, we stop enforcing. And I don't know if you're, some of you are too young, but in the, 19, in the 1960s, Paris had 
riots and had union shutdowns, and for a while they wouldn't pick up the garbage in Paris. There's pictures, historic pictures of the most beautiful streets in Paris with garbage piled like up to the second floor. Our city will look like that. So we're, you know, we're pushing back, and I think our guys are doing the right thing. But this is the, this is how we have to deal with it. I feel passionately about Sitlai. Um, I vetoed two of the Sitlai bills that were passed most recently because we have to be really careful how it's written, or we'll be sued. And if they win, like I said, they can stop us from doing anything. So Waikiki, we're doing the stored property origins and, and sidewalk nuisance enforcing on our sidewalks. But can you believe those were based on stuff, you know, stuff on tents and pallets, and, but not about people. So in Kalakaua, on the sidewalks, people would just be lying down, wasted. And you'd have to walk around them or step over them, big sidewalks. And others were just sitting there with signs. One guy I'd take pictures would say, give me money, alcohol research, you know. And uh, just sit there and harass tourists and locals, harass me when I'd walk by when I'd go surfing. So we looked at different jurisdictions for what laws withstood constitutional scrutiny, you know, when, when there was a legal challenge. And we found in Seattle a law that worked where you could enforce sit lie in commercial areas because you're saying sidewalks are built to walk on, not to sit on, not to lie on, but to walk on. And if it impacts commercial establishments and business during work hours, you can pass a law that says you cannot sit and lie on the sidewalks during business hours. Well, in Waikiki, it never shuts down. I mean, it clubs shut down at 2.33. I don't know. You, some of you young guys will probably know. And um, what is it? Four. Four. All right. So you party hardy, huh? <laughs> so four o'clock. And of course, a lot of tourists come in and they're jet lagged. And if you go to, when I go dawn patrol, they're out walking in the morning because they woke up at three because of the time difference. And they're out walking on the, you know, looking around. And so we were able to pass a bill that allowed us to enforce 24-7. It's a game changer. If you go down Kalakaua and go into pavilions and all those areas, it looks much better. I walked around yesterday. And the visitor industry will say, it is amazing how much of a difference it makes. Now they're up in Kapahulu along the fence, you know, by the golf course. So they just moved out. But they're not in Waikiki, and that's critical because this is a growth engine. It is the growth engine. And if we lose Waikiki, everyone in this room, no matter what your business is, even my business, when I was a lawyer, doing banking and finance and real estate, visitor industry helped float my boat and all of our boats. And so we really, really pushed hard there. But the council keeps wanting to expand it to other areas where there's not commercial businesses. As much as I'd like to sign those bills into law, I'm saying, guys, we're gonna get challenged. And if it looks like we're doing this just to attack homeless, that's where the ACLU can say we're coming after you. Because you can't target a group. Remember, you can't target groups of men, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, or economic level. But you can enforce things across the board on sidewalks and those kind of things. So if you or I sit or lie on them, they'll enforce against us too. If I decide I want to put my business stuff out on the sidewalk, they'll take it away. Um, but it impacts homelessness, homeless folks too. So I vetoed bills, I've overridden it. I wish they would work with me to come up with stronger bills. But this deals with the disruption part. What's the compassion part? Housing. And I've adopted the housing first model, you've heard it. Uh, yesterday's lead story was about the fact that the city gave 2.1 million last year to IHS, said, we'd like you to house 115 families by the end of the year. The end of the year ended at the end of October. They hit their target, they exceeded their target. And 173 people have been housed in Housing First in a year. The city's also partnered up with the visitor industry to house more people, and they've also been housing folks. So when Dave Shapiro wrote a column in Sunday's paper blasting me, saying I'm just cruel and just enforcing, moving people around and not housing them, I would beg to disagree. We've housed people. Now, not enough. There's, you know, 4,000, almost 5,000 homeless folks of which half are unsheltered and we have a long way to go, but we are housing. Here's the point that why housing first works. If you, in the, under the old model, they said before we'll house you, you gotta get off your drug addiction, you gotta get off your alcohol addiction, you gotta 
deal with your mental illness, and then we'll house you. Well, someone on the street, do you think they're gonna be able to do that? They hardly can man, you know, manage just finding food. So what housing first is, is exactly that. We'll house you first with your drugs, with your alcohol, with your mental, mental illness, and then we wrap around a bunch of supportive services to get you better and to keep you stable. And that works. Now, people will complain. Other guys will say, Kirk, I'm busting my butt to pay my mortgage or the rent, and you're housing this guy in a pretty nice unit for free. And he's a bum. He needs to pull himself up and work like I need to. Well, he's not. And what is that person doing to all of you? Every day, we're enforcing. We spend about $15,000 a week enforcing. We spend more picking up all this stuff. What's the impact on our economy in terms of the visitor industry? Now we turned that around, but still we have Kakako. Who is the heaviest user of emergency rooms? The chronic house, homeless. Averaging about $800 per person a week. And the chronic users are the homeless guys, and we pay for it. And where else do they end up? In prison. And we pay for that. They also, in the past year and a half, seven homeless have killed seven homeless on the streets of Oahu. We rank as the safest big city in the United States of America in terms of violent crime and other forms of crime. And visitors come here partly because they feel safe, but homeless killing homeless is bringing our ranking down. And that's not good. And do we pay a price for that? One, it's not safe for us either because while they may be killing homeless, they could hurt one of us too. So there is a price to not doing something. And so while it's expensive, it's less expensive than just the status quo. So we're gonna be working harder to house more people. And we have actually, here's some figures. I just, they did a study, now this is New York City. They did a study of 4,679 homeless folks in, in, in New York City that had chronic severe mental illness or addictions. And they said it costs on average $40,449 a year in emergency room, shelter, and other expenses. And that if they put them into housing first, it saved the taxpayers an average of $16,282. Now ours is new, so we don't have the statistics yet, but I do believe in other cities have shown the same. It's cheaper to house them than to just put them in shelter and back on the street and into the emergency room and into the prisons and other things. Um, Denver had statistics too of great savings. So I don't wanna waste money. I wanna have a positive result and we need to house more people. But we need that housing. We need that housing. And so I am out there. We've announced our Sand Island facility that's gonna open up in about two weeks and it's gonna house about 83 people in a container ice housing with canvas over the top so they can sit outside and there's gonna be a little area like a gathering area, a little village where they're gonna be fed. There's some bathrooms and restrooms and showers. And while 83 people can come, we can cycle through about 250 people every year. And IHS is gonna be managing that. And we're looking for other sites. We bought a site out in Waianae um, huge pushback from the folks in Waianae. Why are you putting homeless here? We're saying housing first, it means housing folks in the area where they're living homeless. You can't take a Waikiki homeless person and put them in Waianae. And you can't put a Waianae person in Waikiki. But Waianae has a lot of homeless people. I committed to house people in three critical areas. The west side, where there's a lot. Downtown and Chinatown, where there's a lot. And Waikiki, where there's a lot. And we'll house them in Waikiki in apartments that we either rent or buy. And we're gonna be announcing shortly the purchase of additional properties. Now the Star Advertiser, you know, and, the, and, and Hawaii News Now have really adopted the homeless thing. And I appreciate that. It's really educated all of us on the issue in many different ways. And I've learned things that I didn't know from the stories they've written. They did a poll. And in that poll, 76% of the people polled said they would not object to having a homeless, um, building or you know, center for homeless to live in in their neighborhood to do their part. But that's theoretical in your head, right? They say that. When we announce actual sites, everyone in that vicinity reacts and says, we don't want them here, put them over there. And the people over there say, we don't want them over there, move them here. And at the end of the day, 
you don't make a decision. So we have to make hard decisions that are unpopular and then we have to make sure housing first works. So the Sand Island site, it took me a year to get it done. Now it's an industrial, if you and I drive out, there's by the BMX racetrack, it's where the Hokulea launches, and next door is the, is the Madsen uh, parking lot for all the cars they bring in. And then there's an industrial park. Well, they went crazy, you know, they didn't want the homeless over there because every car has a car key in it. I didn't know that, by the way. You know when they bring cars over? And it makes sense, right? You can have one guy with all the keys seeing which one fits them. They're in the car. So anyone who needs a car, drive out there, crawl over the fence, you get your car. And I know none of us would, but they're afraid the homeless would, and we assured them we're gonna have security. But if you get pushed back in an industrial era, what happens when you move into your neighborhood and you have children? And you do have all kinds of folks, chronic homeless folks have a lot of issues. So it is a hard, hard decision. The other thing is we're doing low barriers. So Sand Island, you can come in, housing first, low barriers, drugs, alcohol. You can bring your pet as long as it's not vicious. Um, you're going to get your own place. You can lock the door. You can come and go anytime. You know, in these other shelters, there's a curfew. You've got to be in by a certain time or you're locked out. So, and why are we doing that? We want people to come in. We don't want to keep enforcing and have them move in the Kakaaka Waterfront Park. We want them to move to Sand Island. And we're looking at other sites in the area of Kakaaka to see if they'll move, if we put trailers there. The reason why I like trailers, they're not expensive. And two, they're temporary. You can always pick them up and move them somewhere else later as we continue to address this problem. So we're going to keep doing this scattered site, not all in one place. We've been told by providers, if you put over 100 homeless people in one area, area you create a ghetto. When you create a ghetto, you create problems with recovery. And you also invite other types of issues like you saw in Kakaako. So we're moving in a scattered way all around the island. And the good news is the council has said they're going to try to identify nine sites, one in each of their districts, where we could put homeless folks in trailers or buy buildings and that kind of thing. And I've told them I'm on board on doing exactly that. We have created an Office of Strategic Development. We, had, we asked for funding from the council, they cut it out, we got none. So we found money, cobbled money together to hire three people. It is ironic because when Governor Ige called us together to work together, he actually got money released to hire more people. These three people are the ones who are gonna be spending $64 million that we've gotten from the council to buy properties. And you're in this business, it's not easy. So we've made offers, we've gotten some, but we've lost out on others because we're trying to watch how we spend our money. You're, it's your taxpayer dollars. We don't overpay. You know, it's like any offer, you know. This. And so we lost out on a great property that Chaminade was, was selling. Um, and, but we're gonna be announcing shortly purchases of buildings. But I'm asking you, if any of your clients or any of you have buildings that you wanna sell, please, please let us know. And I'm gonna give you the, call, call Sandy Fund P-F-U-N-D, Sandy, at 768-4291, 768-4291. We'd like to hear from you. And we just yesterday made an offer. We got heard there was an offer through going through the court. I signed the offer letter yesterday at like 4.30 to get in there as quickly as we could. It's just four units in Kapahulu, but it's four units we can house people in in an area by Waikiki where all those guys are living along the fence. Um, I didn't want to... Am I exceeding my time? Who's the boss? I'm okay yet? I just want to talk about the three-prong approach we're taking to affordable housing, right? We've talked about the homeless. Um, what are we gonna to do to just encourage more true affordable units being built? And so um, we have three legs, three prongs. One is TOD, Transit Oriented Development, where we're saying around 21 transit stations, we're giving you your zoning up front. You know, all you guys, if you want to do a project, you got to come in and get your zoning. You go through the process, it takes a long time. We're saying right up front, you get it. You get your entitlements if you're a quarter or a half mile of a transit station. And you're gonna get things like height increases, density bonuses, wave all parking, wave maybe sewer hookup fees, park dedication, those kind of things. If you build affordable housing, if you build affordable housing, and it's true, the 80%, 120%, that is the market that's not being built to. They're building to the 140, right? We have 30%, has to be at 140 AMI. 
But really, that's a family. And I have statistics for you on that. Let me just see if I can find it. Yeah. So when you talk about 140% AMI, that's somewhere between, a, you're making for a family for between 115 and 135,000 a year. Okay, I can tell you that most everyone at the city and county of Honolulu, 40, I mean 8,000 people, they're not making that. How about the city of Hawaii? They have about 43,000 employees. They're making between 150 and 135,000. They're not making that. How about our police officers? Are they making that? They're not making that. How about our firefighters? They're not making that. How about all those people when you walk into a branch at Bank Foy or First Wine or Central Pacific or any credit union? Are they making that? They're not making that. But that's the market we're building to. Now, you guys are, and I am, you know, with my wife. Some of you, now nah, all you guys are. I know they're young is making that. But no, if it's 120, that's 114,000. If it's 80% AMI, which I'm talking about, that's 76,650. 76,000, that's a good income. And yet when I talk 80%, go, whoa, you can't build at 80%, we can't afford to build that. But that's the market that people want to rent or buy in. That's the majority of our people. So how do we do that? So I'm talking TOD. You get your zoning up front if you build to that market. And we're trying to make it so you will build to it because we're giving you things like increases and density bonus. You can get more income off your property. You don't have to build parking stalls. You can turn those stalls into units and make money that way. Or you can build parking stalls if you want to and rent them for the guys who are gonna use rail, but it's up to the marketplace. And we waive sewer hookup and park dedication, that's a lot of money, it adds to your capital stack. So that's TOD. The other thing we're doing is ADU, accessory dwelling units, as you know, we passed that law. I put in the bill, the council made it better by putting real teeth to avoid these ADUs being turned into vacation rentals. Because what they require under this bill is if you have an ADU, you must have a rental agreement for six months minimum. Now most rental agreements, the standard rental agreement is one year. And it's prima facie evidence under this law, if you don't have that, and the person who's in the unit isn't the person who signed, because we always ask, give me your ID, it's prima, you don't have to go to court and prove anything. Slam dunk, you're in violation, $1,000 fine a day. That's teeth, that will make people think twice about buy, turning into vacation rental, but why do I like ADUs? ADUs under this law says you can build a second unit on your property as long as your property still is 50% or more left open space, so we're not trying to go lot line to lot line and have no greenery. So you have to have a lot with a house on it that will allow a second unit that won't cover more than 50%. And it has to be between 400 and 800 square feet. Now for a while the bill had amended it up to 5,000 square feet. Well, how much do you think a 5,000 square foot home rents for? It's like having a huge mortgage. Um, so. We said, no, that's not doing affordable housing, that's just putting more housing. And we want affordable housing, so the council backed off. And it's, so there's smaller units for people who can't afford to pay a big rent or buy a place. It's all of us, it's me starting out. When I came back with my wife and we're married, we rented a cottage in Manoa. There's not enough cottages in Manoa, but ADUs are like having a cottage. Now what does that do? One, it provides me an affordable place to rent and live. It also provides income to the person living in the other house to help maybe pay their mortgage, or it could be even one of you buying your first home, but with the income from the rental, you can actually afford to pay your mortgage. Or if you get old, you may move into the ADU and you rent your main unit to a larger family, or you give it to your children or grandchildren. But it's a way to get something to happen that's affordable without government doing anything. We're not spending money, we're not regulating and saying you shall do it. And here's the greatest news. 20,000 lots could be used immediately. If you allow it on the ag lands and stuff, it goes up to 120,000. At the heyday of Ohana, remember Ohana in the old days? There was 25% of all building permits were for Ohana units. That's a lot. So we're seeing, we just passed the bill. It's in, I signed it to law. We see a lot of people coming through. We've approved developers pre-approve certain types of units so they don't have to come in and say we want to do this, get approval for the building. 
They get it up front, so all they need is a sewer hookup, water hookup, those kind of approvals. They need to address things, is there enough sewer capacity? And most places have it. And they got to address, is there enough parking? If you're near a bus route, parking is not an issue. Or if you're on a narrow street, it could become an issue. If you're on a wide street, it's not. So it's case by case, but obviously we want to make sure where there's adequate parking and adequate sewer. The last part, which is the most controversial part, and it gets developers really concerned, is ex exclusionary zoning. It's that 30% at 140% AMI. And we're trying to push it down to a lower um, AMI. And I tell them, but we're willing to make the percentage less too. And we're willing to waive things like sewer fees and park dedication. And we're willing to even look to waive real property taxes if it's rental, long-term rental for 30 years. And we're even willing to waive the GET on rental income, if you're an operator, if you build a unit and you own it and you operate it, they start looking at this and you start adding up all the different dollars per person you say, I can make a profit doing this. So we wanna work with the developers to see how do we incentivize them, not over-regulate them, but incentivize them so they actually build the units that we need. So, you know, in conclusion, the governor and I are having a, uh, working with the, the associate for realtors on November 17th, a call to action, asking everyone to please come forward, landlords, to provide us units to house folks. So besides us, me, I mean the city buying units, can we just rent some from you? And a wraparound supportive housing means there will be someone managing this unit for you, making sure who we place in there is taken care of, and a number you can call if there's a problem. And yes, if it doesn't work, we'll take them out of there. Um, but you are the eyes and ears for us to a degree. So those who could participate, please. And again, if you know of buildings that you would like to sell, we're interested. We have $64 million. We've spent maybe $8 million so far. It's been a real struggle. We're finally getting our, some rubber meeting the road and we're gonna be announcing purchases, but we have a long way to go and you could help us. For me, despite this problem on affordability and, and homelessness, I do believe that it's gotten better in terms of visual impact. I think we've done more than we ever have in housing people and housing first, but we got a huge mountain to climb. I would never promise you that, you know, with, that we're gonna solve the homeless problem, just like I never promise you that building rail means there's no congestion, because every major city that has a mass transit rail project still has congestion. But I believe as a, as a mayor, it's about giving people choice. So if they're stuck in the road for two hours every day going each way from the west side, they can say, we don't want to do this anymore, we'll ride the train. Which gets you from one end to the other in 42 minutes, no matter whether it's raining or not, no matter whether it's an accident on the freeway, no matter whether the zipper lane doesn't work, guaranteed, you'll get to and from work faster. And you decide whether you want to get out. But million people on this island, not one new road or highway being planned. And if tomorrow we said we want to build another highway, 25 years later, because you got to do the EIS, you got to go through approvals, you get huge pushback wherever you're going to go because you're going to condemn land. So rail is about that. And why I stray into that is it's a highly controversial issue. And I'm asking all of you to hang in there, despite the huge frustrations that I know you feel, I feel them too, on these cost increases. Part of it is our hot construction industry, as you know. We rank number one in the country now for the highest construction costs. And that is driving these increases. Doesn't mean we say, okay, no problem, no, fine. We'll just ask you for more money. We need to do better. And I'm stepping up and demanding that they do better. But I'm asking you to hang in on rail. Because without it, there's nothing else. We are just doomed to be stuck in traffic. And I believe once built, it's gonna change, not so much for us today, but 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. I got passionate because I went to college in Boston. And I got off the plane from Hilo. Those days they mandated airlines to fly to certain cities. Hilo to Chicago, can you believe it? On United. Got in a, another plane that arrived in Boston, took the Met, the T, built in 1889. Kid from Hilo, riding on a system built by people at that time, didn't, Hawaii was not even a territory. Overthrow the kingdom, republic, and I get to use it. And I used it, because I had to work. If I wanted more money, my parents gave me a little bit of money. If I wanted more spending money, I had to work. And I used it to get to work. I saw what it did to that city 
over 100 years ago. And I believe that's what we're talking about here, is how do we live better long into the future. So with that, I want to thank you. I do, I'm open for any and all questions. And someone gave me questions. And then my staff prepared answers because they think I wouldn't know what the answer to the question is. <laughs> but, but, and some of them I've answered, but I'd be more than happy I can read these questions or I'm open to any others. You want to ask about pothole filling, why your grave bin, why your garbage hasn't been picked up, picked up your grass hasn't been cut. I'm here to answer in every question you have. You had a program before where you could take a picture of a pothole and send it in somewhere. Is that program still? I don't think that taking the picture of the pothole and sending it in is up and running anymore. But we do have, and I don't have the number in front, we do have a pothole um, action line to call in. And for the most part, we're pretty good at filling the pothole with, within 24 hours. But here's the problem right now with all the rains. Like in, I live in Manoa, East Manoa Road, Manoa Road, they're full of potholes. I drive through them every day, going and coming from work. But they can't fill them because of the rain. and It has to dry out. If you fill a pothole with water in the bottom, when you drive over, you create compression, it lifts up the asphalt and it comes right out. Um, but we filled this year alone over 38,000 potholes, but they still keep appearing. If you give me your name after I'm Paul, I'll, give, I'll call you or, oh good. Oh, it, oh, you got it, okay, Adam. Okay, here's the pothole hotline, 768-7777. 768-7777. And you know, a picture, yeah, that'd be cool. But really, just call and say you got the puka in your road and fill it. And if it's not filled within 24 hours, call them again and complain. And if you don't like that, call me at 768-4141. Yeah. Okay. With housing in the community, uh, I'm sure everyone here does. Um, specifically about ADUs, um, we're one. This is a business we're looking at, and. and uh, we're wondering if, if the city is going to get more precise in, in, in sort of revealing the data about infrastructure so that we're not sort of wandering around blindfolded just waiting for a response from, from sewer and water, but, but can actually go with some precision and, and go to folks that actually have this opportunity in front of them. He had, so he, I don't know if you all heard it, but he said, would the city become more precise to tell people in this area there is capacity and there's parking, sufficient parking, instead of piecemeal coming and saying, okay, we want to do it here, and we tell you, no, you can, or yes, you can, based on what sewer and water says. Um, we are not doing that now. It's a great idea. I'll take it back. I'm not going to promise, hey, we can do it. I mean, I'll push them to do it. Um, I know, for example, I mean, in the urban core, well, I know in Waikiki where we have capacity for sewer and not because of all these hotel projects I'm supporting. Um, like where we are right now has capacity. At the other Waikiki, not as much capacity. But you want to know that in the residential areas. And let me take that back. And you know, perhaps we could publish maps or tell you go to the website and here, and usually it's red. Where the problems are, it's in red. Now the parking issue, I'll have to see if they have the ability to tell you without going there, right? They may, um, but we'll find out. But that's a good thing. It helps, it gives greater incentive for you to do your ADUs. I didn't want to, you know, I didn't ask this, but I went to China a couple weeks ago partly to look at containerized housing for our homeless. But what I, I went to this company in Shenzhen, which is like the capital of all, where all the economic development is happening, in mainland China, just offshore from Hong Kong. And um, this company makes 40% of all the containers in the world that are used by all the shipping. But when they get the old ones back, they turn it into housing. But you wouldn't believe the housing they turn these units into. There's ones that I want. I thought, I have a friend who has this 18 acres in Kula, I thought I want to put one of these on your property and say this is mine so I can come on, you know, on vacation and stay. But they would take these containers and wrap them in vinyl and put planters, curved planters for vines. They put glass folding windows that opened so it became like one big lanai. They had a sleeping room, it was like the living room, dining room, sleeping room. They had a kitchen and they had a bathroom that's nicer than the one in my house with tile and all that. And, you know, so when it closed, it looked kind of Danish modern, white, chrome glass, I mean, chrome around the glass. It was so cool. And then I saw more what is more affordable for us in terms of homelessness. But we're going to do an RFP to see if they'll step up and bid and work. Hawaiian Dredging was there with me, um, along with Brett Hill of Brett Hill and Associates. You know, I'm hoping to be able to put. But what I'm telling you, sir, is that some of these are nice ADU units. And can you imagine putting on a ship? 
and just dropping it in place, um, pretty good. These, this company is doing, they are providing 15,000 of these units for refugee camps for the Syrian refugees in Berlin. They built two hotels, one in Amsterdam and one in somewhere in Australia, Melbourne, I think. 20 stories by just piling containers on top of each other for like half the price. And they look pretty cool. So anyway, thanks for that question. We'll see what I can, can do on the sewer part for sure. Someone had a question over here. I think the guy in the Renz Aloha shirt. Yeah, you. Okay, everyone, so is the city looking at ways to eliminate uh, parking requirements in high density areas to make units more affordable? So as, as you heard me say, through TOD, through the 21 stations, of which many of them are there, our rail station, our rail line is not just haphazardly placed. It's placed based on an EIS that did a study where, where the greatest population is within a half mile of the station. And yes, it starts out in Croc Center and goes through Ho'opili, but there's going to be 25,000 people living there, and the station will be built, they'll build around the station. But the rest of the way is the dense urban core. And so wherever those stations are, you don't have to build parking if you don't want to. You're gonna get the zoning up front. No parking if you don't want to build parking, if it's affordable. And that goes to the bottom line, right? And it allows you to put more units and make the income you need to build these affordable units. So yes, now, as you also saw, Sam Koo recently is doing a project down, down by the Fem News site, that's how I identify it. And uh, they, um, not that I go there, I just drive by. But they, um, they have gotten waivers of parking requirements, not eliminated because they're building affordable housing. The council gave them to them, I support that. So that's your question, absolutely. We gotta give in order to get. And, you come up with a project, we'll be open to forgiving parking. If it's in TOD, you absolutely get it. If it's not within TOD, but it addresses affordable housing, yes, we want to give that to you. And under exclusionary zoning regulations that we have not yet submitted to the council, we'll also provide that waiver of parking, should it pass the council. Okay, that's a good question. Others? Yes. Getting back to your uh, roadways, there are certain roadways in Krakow in particular, the best two parcels that by virtue of being a paper subdivision, someone later uh, through a quit claim uh, yes. deed acquired ownership. But if I recall this statue, because it was a roadway, it was intended as a roadway, it's listed in the city um, maps, subdivision maps as roadways. Should the city decide to, it could exercise ownership and take that property back and convert it into a true roadway. Is the city looking at that at all? There are certain roads, not all of them, mainly the unimproved roads, that are in dispute. We don't know who the owners are, but the Chun family, I think it's Chun, stepped up, bought it through a quick claim deed. They assert ownership, and they're charging people to park on their roads, on the side of the road. Um, and they've asked the city to step in. And here's my understanding. As you know, places like Castle Cook, there, Mililani, um, other projects that Campbell has done down in, in Kapole. They'll build the streets, and on their subdivision maps, it shows as a, as a roadway. But we don't own those roads. We don't pave those roads until they dedicate them to us. And only upon dedication, where they actually transfer title, do we then take ownership, and then we assume responsibility. And some of those roads, we're now starting to take title. As mayor, I've seen this is ridiculous that we have. It's been 40 years in Mililani. Part of the issue was we didn't move fast enough, and then people did things like plant trees in the medium, or there are potholes, or they do other things illegal. And we say, you gotta remove those because we're not gonna take them until they're conforming again. And we played this cat and mouse game, which I think was ridiculous. So we've taken a bunch in Mililani Malka, we're working on Mililani Makai, and other areas in Kapolei. But to your point in Kakaka, I don't think we can take interest in a road unless it's either deeded to us or it's ours. And the issue is, is that we don't believe those, that's our road. Now it's put as a roadway, but it's a disputed road, and the problem, the real problem is, as you know, quiet title, there's been a break in title. Whoever owned it, somewhere along the line, everyone died, and the only way to claim ownership now is to do a quiet title and then do a condemnation action, because we're not gonna take it from the chums. Because they got a quick claim deed, it doesn't mean they own it. 
But here's the other issue, the bigger issue too. There's a big monetary issue because the roads in dispute in Kakaako are the ones that flood, that you drive through and go, what the hell, man? And taking ownership of those roads means we now got to make them conforming, they're non-conforming. We probably have to condemn more property in order to make it wide enough. We have to put the sewer, not the sewer, but the stormwater, huge culverts in. And so it's just, I'm telling you, it's a business decision too. But I told our guys, we can't just stand by and watch this go on forever. That we need to take a more aggressive position and get this resolved. And they're stepping up. I've met with corporation counsel say, don't sit on the sidelines, join in. They've, there's a lawsuit that's been filed now challenging their ownership. At the end of the day, I would like to do something where we fix those roads up because it is in Kakaako. Most of Kakaako is great roads. Here's, I'm getting off the subject again, but you know, guys will fight against the Howard Hughes projects, Ward Village, saying there's no infrastructure there. It's, it's no sewer, no water, no roads. Let's, drive, let's get in our car and drive through Kakaako. Most of the roads wide. Underground utilities, sidewalks. Let's go to Kali and find that. Let's go to Macaulay Moilili and find that. It doesn't exist. Kaka'ako has gotten over $300 million in improvements by the state, not the city, because they took it away. Now that's the good news, we didn't have to pay, the state did. The guys in Hilo paid, and Kauai, and Maui, and of course all of us too. But we actually have sewer capacity there. Some people say the sewer smells, like on South Street, which is, you know what the reason is? It's not because it's over capacity, it's under capacity. So you have a big pipe, and you got sewage in it, and if there's a lot of air, what happens? It starts to break down, the fumes start to develop, and where those fumes go, they rise, and they come out of the manhole covers, and it stinks like a Hanapu Hill. It's not good. But when it's full of sewage, you don't have air, and you don't have the smell. So it's, we have a lot of capacity that's not being used, that's there for those buildings. Those buildings are going exactly where the plan for them to go was. And then they say there's no parks. Well, if you walk from Kapiolani Boulevard to Alamana Boulevard, that's about a 10 minute walk. And what's on the other side of Alamana Boulevard? 125 acre Alamana Beach Park, Kiwalos, and 117 acre Kakaka Waterfront Park. If you took it by square foot, there's probably more park space in this area than in your neighborhood. So, but there's this set in already, hey, no capacity, no parks. Um, and of course, we do have some problem roads, but we have a lot of good roads too. Sorry, I don't give you a firm answer. Yes, we're gonna go and take them over and rebuild them. But those Chun guys, I tell you, they're something else. Talk about chutzpah. Yeah. Other questions? I don't know, I think I answered everything, the three questions you gave me. You talked about chronic homeless and housing those who have severe mental and substance abuses. I talked about that through Housing First. We're committed to do it. Um, eliminating parking requirements, that was asked. And then the last one, Osit Lai, what's been the impact in Fort Street Mall? I think it's been very good. They're over on the other side now, the Ala Park side, because that's not a sidewalk. You know, and so that's the problem. And look at what we had to do in Kapalama Canal. We had to put up a chain link fence so no one has access. Just, I told our guys cynically, so we're putting up a fence to keep the homeless out. Why don't we put them around our bus stops too? Because the homeless are in every bus stop. Everyone will be outside of the bus stop, but we'll have the bus. I'm going, who's winning here? So we're not going to do that. Um, so I think that's it. You know, I want to thank you guys. I enjoyed talking with all of you. Um, I also look forward to working with you. I know I've worked with some of you. And I just want to thank you for making our city a better place. You're a critical part of our city. I love infrastructure. It is the bone structure that every city is built on. The greatest city is Rome, Rome. There's a fountain at the bottom of the Spanish steps. It's a boat shaped thing, Neptune or something. It's been operating since before Christ. And it's getting this water from the same aqueduct that was built before Christ. And all they have to do is every so often, not all, but they gotta chip the lime that gathered, the calcium and lime that gathers in the, in, because it'll fill it up and the water won't be there. They have a great sewer system, part of it built during the Roman Empire. And you can drive on the straightest part of the auto route in Europe, going north of Rome. It was part of the Appian Way. It's built exactly on the foundation of the Roman road. 
infrastructure, Paris, their sewer systems. You've gone tours of a sewer system built during the Renaissance. And in Tokyo, Edo in the old days have what's called the four highways. It's how the samurai came in and out, how produce came in, because Edo was a city of over a million people. Infrastructure, roads bringing produce in. You go to Anchor Water, Anchor Tom in Cambodia, cities of a million people. And you can still see the water systems, the sewer systems. It's what makes people thrive. That's why I support rail and bus, parks, sewer, and even the highly controversial protected bike lane, because I believe someday more people will ride in the flat urban core. But we've got to make it safe or they won't. And that means protecting the bicyclists from the drivers and vice versa. But anyway, infrastructure, and you build on top of it, and you manage on top of it, and you help make our city thrive, because at the end of the day, it's the people who are in there. I want to say thank you so much. Mahalo and aloha. Thank you.